application may need to be aware of those. In particular, there's you might get more deadlocks. You can get deadlocks on commits, which never used to happen. So if uh, your you application needs to be able to handle that. Um, it could be a generic handling. That is, if there's any error, then start the connection again from scratch. You don't have to do anything particularly fancy, but you do need to do something. Um, it can still be a tiny bit of slave lag. It's probably not going to worry you now because one server is, uh, one client is just accessing the one server. It'll do its writes there, it'll do its reads, it'll be able to read back what it just wrote. So that's not really a problem unless you've got some particular application where a different client wrote to a different slave and, that, and that's an issue to you, which one got there first. You have to get pretty specific to find out where that's a problem. Um, there's an extra latency in commits. Um, when we, when the application sends its update statement in, that has to go around to all the other servers. And then when you do a commit, it basically takes a ping time to the longest ping time of any server extra in that commits. So if you're in the one data center, you know, it's one millisecond extra per commit. If you're going across data centers, 10, 20 milliseconds, whatever it is. If you're going around the world, 150 milliseconds extra. Um, that's not much for one commit, but if you have an application which is doing many commits for one user, in a, uh, one user transaction, then you've got some response time issue there. Throughput is reduced by 8.73%. Anybody know where I got that figure from? A specific test case that we've got. <laughs> yeah, I just pulled that one out. That's right. Um, there's a little bit of throughput reduction because there's a bit more work for it to do. It does a bit more network stuff. Um, and a bit more CPU stuff. So it just reduces the throughput a little bit as well as the response time. Uh, and you need at least three servers and maybe four. So what's going on with that is um, if we have two servers running and they're talking to each other and this link was broken, then each server says, well, how am, am I now the, the master server or am I the one that was broken off? And uh, it says what we used to have was two servers running now we've got one server running. That's what this one's thinking about. And it says, well, one is not bigger than half of what we had before. So it says, well, I'm not the quorum. I'm not more than half of what we had before. And this one also says, I'm not more than half of what we had before. So that's not going to work. What you need is three servers. And then if one of the servers fails, these guys are still talking to each other, so this one can say, look, there's two servers still in our component. Two is more than half of the three that we had before, therefore this is now the primary component and we'll continue serving. This guy says, well look, I'm just running by myself, I can't speak to either of my friends, so there's now one server in this component. One is less than half of the previous three, so that one will um, refuse future requests. So that one will just stop working and complain. When the networks come back on, it'll join back in and catch up and everything will be fine. But you need to have at least three to do that. Anybody thinking about using it in two data centers? Yes? Okay. How many data centers was that? Two. two. Right. So let's say you had a nice cluster of three servers in that data center and a nice cluster of three servers in this data center and they're all talking to each other. You can do groups so there's only um, one connection between the two. But if the, <coughs> if the links between those two data centers were cut, <coughs> then suddenly this server here is saying, well look, there's three in this component. There used to be six. Three is not greater than half of six. Therefore, this is not the primary component, so we're not continuing. And these servers up here say the same thing. So if you want to go multiple data centers, that multiple number is three. Three data centers. Okay? 
um, that's a short story, then uh, there's more argument and debate about little things you can do to fix that. But basically you need to be thinking about three if you're thinking about data centers. Um, well, some smart people will be saying, hey, that's easy. You just put two servers in this data center and one server in that data center. And then if you break the link, this one will continue on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this will give you some some protection, but it's not as good as having three separate data centers. Data centers are cheap now, anyway. I mean, you and me. Just make another one in the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give me one of your spares? You could um, make one of your data centers be uh, just a virtual machine somewhere, just keeping up with the updates, but not serving any read requests. Um, there's you know, a few few options you can do, um, which I'm not going to go into the details of. But the answer is you need at least three servers. That's a gotcha. The starting price is three. Um, it's really four because, as I said, when one comes out and then comes back in, it's going to put a heavy load on the other guys. It might take one offline even, so you might want to have four. Four is not a particularly good number. For well, do you want to have five? <laughs> five? Okay, there's a limit to how many you can have. There's a performance limit and that is about six. So uh, the number six I've also just made up on the spot. Well, we've looked at some performance graphs and after you've added six servers it just starts to slow down. There's just more intercommunication work going on and you're not really getting much more benefit in terms of total transactions per second out of the whole thing. Um, your particular use case might be different to the sysbench that's been done on, um, but think of about six. So it's not scaling up to 100 servers, that's not what we're talking about here. We're scaling up to six, seven if you push it, around about that number. And the last gotcha is it's in ODB only. On Tuesday I talked about the TOCUDB, which is meant to be already 20 times faster than InnoDB. So if, uh, if, if you're going to use Galera, it's only InnoDB. All right, what's next? Classic replication fights back, yes. With um, version 10 of MariaDB, we've got some new classic replication features. We've got parallel updating, so that means running uh, multi-threaded updates on the slave. That wasn't the case in previous releases, but now it's a goer, which means that we don't really get the slave lag problems that we used to get. So we fixed slave lag with parallel replication. I talked more about that on Tuesday. Uh, the other thing we've got is global transaction IDs, and that helps with the repointing issue, where you're pointing your slaves from that master, then you have to repoint them to the other master. Again, I spoke about that on Tuesday. New feature in MariaDB 10, and that solves some of those problems. And we've now also got multi-source replication. So the old system, a master, no, rather, let me say slave, could only get its data from one master. It couldn't read it from another master. That was not a goer. So, you could daisy chain them, so that master could copy from there, and that master and that slave could copy from there. That was okay, but no, um, never could you have two. But now we can have two, so that solves some of our re, our repointing problems as well. So we can make a uh, topology like this one. Now I've got six slaves and two masters, and all of the slaves are reading updates from both of the masters and the masters are reading updates from each other. If you're going to set up a topology like this, you're going to be probably, you still have to split your reads and writes and I suggest you put all your writes to one of the masters and the other master is the backup master. Or grow your own topology, this isn't the only way you can do it. Um, but that thing will keep running without having to have the 
things repointed when something fails. Let's check our list. Any, any questions? All happy with that? Okay, so this new thing, did it fix the slave layer? Yes, we pretty much fixed that up with the parallel replication. Um, change the application to split reads and writes, we still have to do that. Load balancing between slaves, same issue. Cannot scale writes, same issue. Same effort required to resync a slave after maintenance. Well, that's been fixed. Um, when, with the new multi-source replication, we don't really have to do any of that repointing, resyncing stuff. Um, hang on. Resync isn't fixed. Resync isn't fixed. Repoint. The bottom one's fixed. Why isn't? Why did I write fixed for sync? I like the green. Um, Resyncing will be made a little bit easy because of the global transaction IDs. But yeah, I shouldn't shouldn't really count that one now. I'll just cross that one off. <coughs> and here's a bit of a summary. Galera is easy. There's a bit of a learning curve, so. Have a look in the instruction manual and um, get some of those $5 virtual servers and give it a good old test and a good old play with it before you put it in production. Test it particularly with your own application because your own application will have its peculiar peculiarities in terms of what it's doing. The multi-source and the parallel and the global transaction ID replication now is worth another look. Um, Maybe it can get bigger on the read scaling. Maybe you can have 100 servers if you go that way. Um, you're not scaling writes, but maybe you can scale the read bigger. So you might have a specific case where you want to go back to the multi-source thing. Um, it can probably go a little bit faster because it doesn't have the overheads of Galera. And it's not as hard as it used to be. So I think the bottom line is Galera is easy. Use Galera, it's good. But if you have some specific issues, maybe look at the other ones. I'm doing some workshops in February in Sydney. If you want to come along, we get to get our hands dirty and play with all that stuff. We'll crash nodes and bring them back up again and uh, all kinds of stuff. That'll be fun. And that's all I've got for today. So this is obviously not Dallas, but um, I was asked to do this at the last minute and um, I'm just reusing some slides from an uh, earlier conference, so ho hopefully you'll bear with me. The important things to have, uh, if you want to go and grab the complete slides for this, this is actually a 90 minute talk. Um, I'm not going to do the bulk of the material in here, um, but if you want to go get the whole material, there's uh, a slide share and a GitHub uh, site you can go to. and The GitHub one will have so in this deck, and we'll, depending on what people are interested in, um, I've got a, some little examples of Neo4j and MongoDB. Um, the GitHub site will have a couple other ones as well, Redis, and maybe the, I'm not sure if the Cassandra one's pushed yet, but there's a few, probably a couple other ones on there as well. Okay, so um, I guess, um, who, who knows uh, Groovy in the room? Not very many people. So you're all database people, is that? Okay, who knows JDBC and knows Java? Same, similar sort of numbers, a couple more hands. So you're, um, okay. So um, what languages do most people use? PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, that, those sort of ilk of languages? Is that what we're, okay. So the goal of the, um, libra the SQL libraries in, in Groovy are to make uh, accessing a database as easy in, uh, the, on the JVM as Ruby or Python or whatever would make um, as a scripting language. So if, if just to, by way of motivation, don't worry if you can't see all the uh, lines of code on there. This is um, accessing a, a, a database in Java. Groovy would sort of say, well, a lot of that's boilerplate, so we'll just let you do the, those bits there, which are the interesting bits. And um, yeah, if you were doing it in Ruby or something, it would be a similar number of lines of code. 
Underneath the covers, it's using all the straight JDBC APIs, and you can dive down and get to that if you ever need it, but you can do it at all at this simple, simple level as well if you want. Um, so basically, I was just going to run through what, what are the features of this API and how does it enable you to do things. Um, if, you've never, if you're never going to program in Groovy or uh, Java, some of the details of connecting uh, might not be too relevant to you, but so I'll go over that fairly quickly and then we'll have a look at some of the other stuff that's there. So it, it turns out that the JDBC API, is, it's a fairly rich, rich API and it's got a lot of features in terms of the transactions, in terms of the ability to access uh, store procedures, doing things via prepared statements so you don't have uh, SQL injection uh, issues and so on. It's quite a well thought out uh, library, it's just a little bit of a pain to uh, access it in the Java world because of the, the, um, the, some of the checked exceptions and some of the other boilerplate that you need to do to uh, make use of it. So let's just dive in and start having a look. So basically it's just, it's, it's just a thin layer that sits above JDBC API and you, your Groovy application would call into that. And if you're using Grails or something like that, a lot of this would even disappear even further uh, away and you wouldn't need to worry about it. But um, if you're wanting to call it directly from Groovy, they're the sort of examples we're going to see. Okay, so um, there's a couple of bits of information that the JDBC libraries require of you. And um, this is the, the bits of information that are interesting. So there's a username and password. If your database doesn't have authentication, you can leave those bits out and leave out some parameters and everything will still work. Um, JDBC tries to make accessing any RDBMS and a couple of non-RDBMS uh, drivers look the same, even though we all know that uh, the wonderful thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. There's, there are differences. Um, the JDBC API tries to hide all that away and um, one of the things that percolates back up then is, okay, I'm, you're, you want to talk to a particular kind of database, there's going to be a magic driver there that translates between JDBC's APIs and the particular database you're using. In this case here, there's a HSQL DB one, but there's, I think on my laptop I've got like 20 different uh, drivers talking to MariaDB, Oracle, you name it, there's, there's drivers for any of those. So you can replace that with whatever driver you want to talk, talk with. And um, then when you're talking, that'll let you talk to any uh, Oracle, HSQL DB, MariaDB database in the world. So you need to feed in a URL if you like, um, as you would going to a particular website. This is a URL to the driver to tell it which database in, within the world you want to speak to. And the JDBC part is, is a fixed part. HSQL DB will be some uh, constant that your driver uh, recognises as, as relating to me. Then there'll be a bit of extra information that might be a, might contain a host name, might contain the name of a database, might contain other little keywords like is it an in-memory database, this is the one I'm using here, or is it a file-based database, and so on. You can put drivers into different modes to talk to different kinds of databases. So there'll be a URL that um, spells things out and eventually it might have like a database name. Here I'm, I'm talking to a marathon database. So this is information that the driver is going to use. I just go SQL.new instance, pass it all this info, I've, I've now got an instance to use. When I'm finished playing around with the database, I can just close that. Okay. Um, there are some other flavours uh, that you can use in, um, instead of having four parameters here, I can sort of pass in maps of parameters and set other stuff. So if, if you want to cache things, you want to turn on various kinds of um, uh, results at concurrency features, there's, there's probably 10 parameters you can switch on or off. Anything that's part of the, the SQL API that's got a setter or a getter, you can feed in this way. Um, there is also a, a with instance, instead of this new instance, if you do with instance, basically you just have a chunk of code, you, you do all your SQL manipulation in, inside this uh, code block here between the two curly braces, and you don't need the close. The with instance will auto-close. So it saves you one line of uh, a, a trivial bit there, but at least you can not forget it. 
There's a few other uh, variations to deal with data sources. So some drivers will give uh, also, so this particular driver, as do most of the recent databases, uh, support data sources, but if you're using um, some sort of pooling framework or you're using a, some sort of uh, enterprise server, there'll be other ways in which you can get data sources and there's ways to use those as well. Okay, we'll skip over that. This, this is showing you how you might use a, um, a pooling, a, a connection pooling library. All of that's supported and you just, um, there's just ways to call it that'll allow that to work. We'll skip over that. Okay, so let's, this is where we, where we start to do um, more interesting stuff. Basically, this um, the new SQL that we were creating before gave us this SQL instance, and we just go SQL.execute, and we can give it a chunk of SQL code. Okay, we'll see a few variations of this in a minute, but that's, this is the standard, um, the, the standard fallback for just running any uh, chunks of SQL code. So here we, we can, um, you can do any sort of uh, DDL here where, where dropping tables, creating tables, whatever, and we're just feeding that in as a, as a, basically as a string, and then the whole thing will get executed as a, as a chunk of SQL. So that's the simplest form. Make sense? Yep. Not, nothing magical yet. Um, there are a few variations. So um, underneath the covers, when you do this SQL.execute, it'll package this up inside a statement and, and send it across. Um, there's a few variations that do some smarter stuff for you under the covers. So I'll skip, I'm gonna, I'll come back to, since most, uh, quite a few of you don't know Groovy, I'll come back to the first example and I'll explain the uh, second example first. Um, if, and, and I'm gonna do, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, I'm doing, I'm going to do, change, do, there's two changes at once here, which um, I'm going to, instead of using execute, I'm going to use execute insert. This will allow me to get back a little bit of extra information if I want it. The extra information will be any auto-generated keys. So one of the things here, we're letting the athlete ID be generated by the database. It's not important, we could, uh, but that's just how we've decided to do it for this example. And we can get that key value back. That's all this is showing. So if I don't want the key value back, I could just use execute there. If I do execute insert, it allows me to get back any generated keys. And there's versions of this that'll let you, instead of just getting back all the keys, I can get back, if there's a, a multi-column key that's generated, I can get back just parts of it if I wanted to. So the execute insert's got a, a few smarts in it. The other thing that's happened here is when my athlete insert is just a string, so it's just a chunk of SQL, um, the string isn't complete, like in this example here, the, whole, the full SQL is, has been spelled right out with um, the actual va data values inside it. Here there's uh, placeholders. The question marks here will get replaced with whatever parameters get fed in. And here we're just passing in two parameters. And what happens underneath the covers, when uh, this gets sent to the database, it'll create a prepared statement and it'll send those parameters via that prepared statement. So what the prepared statement's gonna do is it um, only allows uh, in these, where the question marks exist, uh, complete values. So there's no chance of any SQL injection when this is occurring. So you don't need to know that that's happening underneath the covers for you. You just call SQL, if you, if you pass it parameters like this, it'll automatically do the smart thing using prepared statements. Now, Groovy's got a special kind of string called a, a Groovy string or a G string for short. I didn't make the name up, but um, inside these uh, G strings, you've got interpolated values. So here's a string. The triple quotes just mean it's going to be a multi line string, and it's just got characters inside it. But if there's a dollar sign, then whatever's inside here will, will get evaluated and embedded into the string. And if you pass a G string to execute, it's smart enough to pull these out as parameters and actually feed them in in this form underneath the covers here. So you can have something that, one of the problems with all these question marks is it's often a little bit hard to you know, line things up in your mind. Oh, the second question mark, was that the first name or the last name? And you're kind of looking at the code and trying to wonder. It becomes very obvious in this G-string form, but you don't, um, 
run into any SQL injection problems because it gets converted into this parameterized form under the covers. Does that make sense? So you get expressions that are very, very simple. They can do smart stuff. And um, uh, yeah, it's very easy to operate on. There's, there's one other slight variant to execute called execute update. Again, you don't ha you're not, no one's requiring you to, you, you can run uh, a chunk of SQL code that doesn't update in, with a normal execute, because it's just SQL. But if you want uh, to find out how many rows actually changed, if you use execute update, you'll get back the number of rows that got changed. So if that's important to you, you can double check that value. All's, all good so far? And you can do all the CRUD operations. So we've done create, we've done reads, we've done updates. Oh, actually, we haven't done any interesting reads, so we'll come back to more reads in a second. You can do a delete as well, it's just a chunk of SQL code. Okay, so we'll now look at the reads, the, fi the, the other thing in CRUD. And there's a few different variants that are, are allowed. Um, at the JDBC API, everything's done with result sets. And if you just use the qu a query command, again, you just feed in a chunk of SQL, and that can be a g-string. It can have those parameters like we saw before, and it'll, it'll all happen via prepared statements. Um, you feed in a chunk of SQL, and it comes back, and it's using the actual same result set that um, uh, the JDBC API would give you. Okay? If you use query, you'll get it, get it at that level. That can be useful for um, certain kinds of streaming scenarios. It's, it's the bare metal flavor of, of uh, using the, the, the Groovy API. Most people, though, will use the other methods I'm about to tell you. And one of them is each row. We'll look at first row and rows and other things uh, shortly. So each row, it's a bit like query here, um, but instead of you having to iterate through the result set manually using next here and doing stuff, it'll execute a chunk of code that's a closure. So it's just a, chunk, a function here, a chunk of code. It'll execute that for each of the rows that come back from that query. Yep. So row happens to be the variable name I've given it, and I can just I can go row dot last name, which will be the same as doing the get string last name. You, you, rather than using get strings and uh, get you know, get string with a name or get string with a column, you can use well, once you move to these other methods that I'm going to tell you about. It's actually a, an enhanced uh, result set that comes back that lets you use normal Groovy's uh, index notation or um, normal setter, setter and getter style uh, notation on here. So it's nice, nice and simple code. There's a first row variation that'll just give you back the first row. Um, just to show you that I said it's an enhanced result set that comes back. It's actually both a list and a map and a result set. So you can actually do dot two map string, which is a method only available on maps, uh, if you wanted to, and it'll it'll come back looking like that. As well as the smart things we saw here, you can do row minus one. So in Groovy, in all your other collections, minus one will mean the the last column, minus two will be the second last column, and so on. Um, you can use those uh, parameters. You can use a minus one column on the things that come back, and all of that will work properly. Okay, another method that's um, available on all collections is collect, and given that, uh, um, well, I said uh, each row, well, okay, so I should probably take a step back. So each row will execute a chunk of code for each of the rows, that bit there. There's another variation called rows, and it'll return you I said here, each time this executes, it'll be a, a resu an enhanced result set. You'll get a list of enhanced result sets that gets returned here. Okay, so it'll be the entire list of rows that match the query if you don't use paging and other batching and other things, which we'll see later on. So once I've got this uh, list of enhanced um, result sets, I can collect the first name and the last name joined with commas and what have you. And uh, you don't, it doesn't have to be a full result set that comes back. It can be a scalar value. So if you're doing select count star, uh, that'll come back and you can get its value. The 
conventional way is to give it a name using as num and then you can use the, the uh, nice property access to, to access it but you can go and use um, square bracket zero and things like that to get the scalar values straight out of the uh, thing that gets returned. Um, so sql.execute, a big chunk of DLL, that'll go and create a couple of ta tables. Um, I can then uh, insert some data into this table. Now I've got a stored procedure here. Now this is just going to go and basically do a join on, on the two tables that we've just gone and uh, whacked into our little database here. Some marathon runs or the world records in fact and some marathon athletes and uh, we could just go and execute a chunk of SQL code that did a join on those two tables. So um, uh, we could easily do that, but what I've gone done here is done a stored procedure that'll do that. And it's easy to, to, to call a stored procedure. I can go and um, use each row, first row, rows, all the things we saw before, and just do call. Okay, and get, get stuff back. If I've got parameters, there's special notation for feeding in parameters and getting things back, little placeholders like we saw before. And there's a special convention if you've got in and out or in out parameters. There's a, there's a special convention for feeding the parameters in. You feed parameters in and anything that's coming back out, you give it a type and it comes back as a typed variable. So there's syntax for that. Okay, there's facilities for accessing metadata, so you can find out column names and stuff like that. We might skip over the details of this and um, try to show you some more interesting stuff. The, here's, um, if you want to do, invoke a transaction, sql.withtransaction, and you can put in uh, any of the statements we saw before. I'm calling insert athlete, which just has a sql.execute insert inside it. So you just do a bunch of those and that'll happen transactionally. If I want to batch things together, two different flavors. There's one for um, just chunks of SQL code. And there's one that uses stored procedures that will be chunks of SQL code all uh, corresponding to the one query. So here's one insert. I can feed in all the, da all the data to that. There are variations, so if you're not, if you're using, the, accessing this from Java or a templating language and you don't have g-strings available, there's other notations you can use, instead of using dollar type things, there's um, colons and question marks uh, with dots and things that you can use to, to access this stuff as well. It's a, just a, sort of a little um, uh, admission that Java integration is useful sometimes. And um, what I didn't show was I might have skipped over it really quickly. There's a paging thing as well. Instead of getting back all the rows, I can just say, give me back rows five to 10 or whatever. Okay, there's a, a whole layer that sits on top of that that lets you sort of not have any SQL anywhere. So, so the, the, the JDBC API says, you will still see the, you will still see the SQL. Um, but we'll hide away all the connectivity details. Datasets is a layer that sits on top of what we've just shown, shown you before, and it says, and you'll also not need to see the SQL anymore. Okay, how does this work? It's still doing the SQL underneath the covers, um, but there's an add, add method. Uh, so, so when you, you create a data set, you give it a table name, then um, if you add something to it, it'll let you use all the column names from that table as the, the properties that you can add in and you'll, it'll look like you're just using it. It's, sort of, it's the name parameter conventions in Groovy or it looks like a map type thing. You can just add things in. You can iterate over the, if you do athletes.each, underneath the covers it'll do a select, select star from athletes. Okay, and you can then access everything. Um, it's got some smart stuff as well in that if you do find all, um, it'll do selective queries. And, and I'll skip, skip over, I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'll skip over. If you had these, uh, what is it, seven lines, 
you'll go query equals athletes, find all the, the first names that are after P in the alphabet. Now find all the people born after January 1970. Now sort them based on the date of birth and then reverse that sort. You might think, oh, there's several queries that have gone off to the database. No queries have gone off to the database yet. If I print out qu query.sql, you'll get this thing here. Select star from athlete where first name's greater than question mark and date of birth greater than question mark, order by date of birth descending. It's just remembered that fact. If I went and did more find alls, more sorts, whatever, it would keep building upon information there. As soon as I, and, and I can print out the parameters as well, and it'll show me the parameters that feed into those placeholders. When I actually then try to use it with rows or um, uh, print, I actually print out the, I did an each and printed them all out. Um, at at uh, that point, one query would go to the database. So it's an optimized, lazy query that goes to the database. If you think you've seen something like this before, that's how link in uh, .NET works. This was out way before dot, uh, that was around. The .NET one's actually better for a couple of reasons, but I won't go into that. So that's data sets. Um, I'll just do one minute on MongoDB and one minute on Neo4j, just to see, it's just for anyone who's uh, interested in seeing other kinds of databases. So these databases aren't relational databases. I cannot easily access them uh, using the, um, the libraries that I showed you just before. A couple of them do have pseudo JDBC-like drivers these days. So the Cassandra query language is very close to SQL, but not quite, and so on. But I'm just, they all come with native, uh, usually multiple native uh, drivers, and that's what we're gonna use. MongoDB is a document-style database. And so we can just basically uh, create new uh, tables, or drop one, and then we'll now create stuff, and we can just feed in documents, so basically, which can be maps, maps of data and maps of maps and so on. Um, we can feed information in and update information. We can feed in, uh, this is a chunk of JSON, so that's a, that's a multi-line string with name value like J, uh, in JSON format, information inside it. We can uh, get, get a JSON library to parse that and feed that into the, the documents that we've uh, fed and now we can start printing information out about the, the, the table. Trivial stuff to do. Um, there's special features inside MongoDB for doing different kinds of aggregation. And again, a JSON-like or, or um, uh, uh, there's a few different, um, yeah, there's a special notation for pulling information out in various ways that uh, make use of some of the scaling capabilities of that kind of database. Neo4j is a graph style database. You can run this um, as a native Java uh, embedded server or as a, as a dedicated server. And why would you use something like Neo4j? It's storing information in a map style syntax, but it um, in particular lets you store information about graph nodes. So basically our, our rows, if you like, that we were storing in the other, um, the, the other tables, we had a um, normalized set of athletes and a normalized set of runs and if we wanted to do complex queries like who uh, beat so-and-so's record that came after so-and-so's whatever that preceded this one, um, then we could do that in SQL, but it actually be the, the, the query becomes complex and the time it takes to execute some of the kinds of queries that you might end up with uh, become, uh, it explodes out exponentially. With a graph database, it's storing additional information that allows queries that, that span over this graph to be super, super efficient. And um, that's what uh, this one does. And just to show you what it ends up looking like, here's, here's some of the sorts of queries. You can ask who won in London. Well, you, you find out, um, get the relationships that where someone ran, an athlete ran a, uh, a race and the venue for that race was London and so on. And um, you can th 
qu quite quickly get complex things like uniqueness values, traversing paths, different kinds of relationships, different depth levels that you're willing to traverse on the graph, um, and you can get very, very complex traversal type um, procedures for, for accessing these things. There's a nice little language called Gremlin that lets you, in a very much more compact format, express similar sorts of things. So we, we're finding all the vertices filtered by some parameters that, here that supersede certain information and so on. So there's some very, very nice ways to query those kinds of databases. Okay, um, that's it. So if you want all the examples or the full set of slides, go to those uh, SlideShare and GitHub sites. Okay, thanks.